You're listening to the Business Brain Food Podcast. This is episode number 121. Welcome to the podcast that gives you direct access to the world's leading business building experts. Head to maxmyprofit.com.au to catch up on past episodes, download your free business growth tools, and access show notes for every single episode. Now, here's your host, Ben Futrell. Well, g'day and welcome back to another episode of Business Brain Food. This, my friend, is the podcast that's 100% devoted to taking you and your business to the next level. And the good news is, doesn't matter whether you're brand new to this business thing, so maybe you're just scratching that entrepreneurial edge, or maybe you're like myself and you've been in business for a long, long time. No matter what, there's something new we can do to take our business to the next level, and today is absolutely no different. That's the good news. Uh, today, I am joined by one of the Kennard family, Angus Kennard. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with Kennard's hire, you will be after this, but I'm pretty sure you would have heard the name. It's one of Australia's, well, it's Australia's leading uh, hire company. There's no doubt about that. Uh, they've got 165 stores, 1,400 employees. Uh, and have been going for 69 years, about to celebrate their 70th birthday. And I've got uh, Angus coming onto the show to, to chat to me a bit about uh, you know, his involvement in the business. He's been involved with Ken Arts for 20 years and was appointed as CEO last October. And uh, you know, it was interesting to have a chat with Ken, with with uh, with Angus about you know how a company has evolved over sixty nine years, how technology has changed, what they're doing, how working in a family business, and you know what are their core values, and you know what is his secret sauce to to success. So we're going to hear all about that. Now, before we do get Angus onto the podcast, I want to say once again thanks for tuning into the Business Brain Food Podcast. If you're a first time listener, welcome, welcome. It's good to have you on board. Uh, you know, the podcast has uh, this is one hundred and twenty one episode, one hundred twenty one. So I've been around for a little while. Go back and listen to the previous 120 episodes, uh, but certainly stick around and listen to this one first. Um, now, if you're a returning listener, like an avid fan that tunes in every single week, once again, I want to say thank you to you. And I know you probably get sick of me thanking you each week, but I really do appreciate it. You know, at the end of the day, we wouldn't have a show if it wasn't for you tuning in each and every week. All right. Now, I wanted to let you know about a couple of exciting things going on. Uh, if you're in Brisbane, Sydney, or Melbourne, I'm going to be running a uh, a training series of workshops on the Eastern Seaboard, kicking off, I think, on the 28th of this month of February. So if you're listening to this somewhere down the track, you may have missed out, but still go and check anyway because we uh, are going to be doing these quarterly throughout the year. Uh, so the first set of events, I'm going to be taking you through a new business growth blueprint that I've developed. Over the last 20-odd years, You know, having worked with hundreds of businesses in dozens of different industries, what I have worked out is what works and what doesn't. And I've got a five-stage business growth blueprint that I've developed with my business partner. And I'm going to go on the road and I'm going to start teaching people how to use that blueprint to grow their business. And it kicks off on the 28th of Feb in, uh, oh, sorry, 29th of, no, it's not 29th of February. It's going to be the 1st of March in, uh, in in Brisbane. Anyway, head to businessfasttrack.com.au. That's businessfasttrack.com.au and select a date and venue that suits you. And, uh, and, and yeah, I look forward to seeing you there. It's a, a couple of hours, completely free, obligation-free. And the reason I do these, uh, these workshops for nothing is I love to meet people, do a bit of educating, but it also gives you the opportunity to meet me, learn a bit about what we do. And, of course, if you'd like to become one of our members, then you'll have that opportunity at the end of the evening to talk to us further about that. There's no hard sell. There's no, you have to buy anything. There's no obligation. Uh, you know, we, it simply is about all value, making sure you get a huge amount of value out of the workshop with me. So you can sort of get a feel for who we are, what we do and how we can help you. Uh, and like I said, if it's a good fit for you, great. We'll work together. If not, that's great as well. We, uh, we're okay with that. We understand that you're not all going to work with us, uh, but head to businessfasttrack.com.au and you'll be able to find a date and venue convenient to you. All right. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's get Angus on the show. I think I sort of gave him a bit of a brief introduction there, but as like I said, he was appointed Kennard's highest CEO on the 24th of October 2016. He started with Kennard's back in 1996, so he's just done his 20 years. And uh, it's interesting to hear his story. In fact, I won't give it away in this intro, but uh, you know they have a policy about working in the family business, which means you can't work in the family business from day dot. So you'll hear a bit about how that works. And now they are Australia's leading equipment hire business, and... Um, you know, I think you'll be pretty impressed to hear 165 stores across Australia, 1,400 employees. They went through a period where they doubled every five years for 20 years. And, you know, it's a family business. It's been an interesting journey that they've been on. So I think that you're going to really enjoy this chat. It's always good to get somebody on that has, you know, been involved in a business that has had this growth, not an overnight success, but I don't know too many businesses that are, you know, in like 69 years to get to where they are. Uh, but not not an overnight success, but definitely 
an awesome uh, in Australian success story when it comes to Aussie businesses. So without any further delay, let's get uh, Angus on the show. Business Brain Food. So really excited today to have Angus Kennard coming onto the Business Brain Food podcast. You know, Kennard's hire is about to celebrate 70 years in business, which is a monumental achievement. Uh, welcome to the Business Brain Food podcast, Angus. G'day, Ben. Great to be with you. All right. And so the first question I always ask every guest is for them to share something quirky with us. And uh, Angus is going to be no different. So Angus, share something quirky with the listeners. It's time for something quirky. And now, something quirky. I really uh, like skiing fast and recording my time on ski tracks. Ski tracks? Is that like an app or something that you use? or? Yeah, it's an app um, for snow skiing. Oh, fantastic. I've never even heard of it. So, yeah, and it is a downhill skiing, so you just go straight down as quick as you can and hope you don't hit something. <laughs> yeah, and you compare your top speeds with your mates. Absolutely fantastic. Maybe you could tell us a bit about the history of Kennards and how you got involved. I know for you it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a smooth you know, transition straight into the Kennards family business, was it? No, we, um, my parents have always said that I've, any family member getting into the business has to work um, outside the family business for a period of over five years. Uh, the theory is that they want uh, um, you to make your mistakes on someone else's watch, but also on having to perform and be managed by someone else outside the family business was really important. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, that you had to do that first to earn your stripes for the right of opportunity to um, think about entering the family business. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, family business is one of those things that a lot of people struggle with. Have you, how have you found the whole family business thing? Is it an easy, easy, easy thing to be a part of, or do you find it has its moments? Or you know, what, what, where do you, where do you sort of sit with that? Oh, I think every family business has its moments um, because every family has their moments. Yeah. And, uh, so any any family that's telling you they don't, um, I would probably question. Uh, I think for us, you know. It's, you've just got a lot more stakeholders that you've got to manage mm. and so it's being, I guess, cognizant of that. Um, given that we're three generations, I've got my father who um, is really fortunate that he's still around and can offer um, advice and loves to give it when he gets the, the opportunity. Um, you know, and I guess being able to tap into that experience is great. Um, I've also got a number of siblings that, you know, I work with or report to or report to me. Um in a way that, you know, that can pose challenges as well. So when you're dealing with people and personalities, um, you know, often that, you know, sometimes can be a challenge. Yeah, definitely. Now, there's quite a few listeners that are outside of Australia who may not know of the Ken Art Success story, but maybe you could take us back a little bit in time because I think it's quite a uh, inspirational story, an encouraging story for small business in Australia in particular. Uh, you know, it was started by your grandfather in 1948 out of Bathurst, wasn't it? Yeah, so my grandfather um, lived in Bathurst. It was after the war. There was a bit of a housing boom going on. It was the day before um, premix concrete. And he was um, he used to sell, you know, a number of different types of equipment, one being a concrete mixer. And a gentleman came in one day and said, um, can I borrow your concrete mixer? Um, he said, I can't loan it to you, but I'll hire it to you. And I guess that simple... Um, ability and initiative to solve a customer's need is actually how our uh, business began back in 1948. Um, and so we started hiring concrete mixers and then it led to wheelbarrows and it led to a lot of other things um, out in Bathurst. And he moved the business to Sydney in 1951 um, and worked out of my grandma's garage in Mossman. And, um, you know, it was a, a few years before, you know, she got sick of that answering phones and having a a garage full of <laughs> I could imagine, yeah. <laughs> so then they, you know, I guess opened their first branch um, in Artarman. And in what, what year was that? That was in 1951, the first branch in Artarman? Uh, 1951 was when they moved to Sydney. Um, it wasn't until um, I think it was the late 50s, early 60s that they actually uh, moved it to Artarman. Um, and then um, my dad and my uncle um, took over the business in the 1960s and um, – they had a fantastic relationship, um, business relationship for 27 years, of which they also started other businesses, including Kennard Self Storage. Um, and at that time, in 1991, when my cousin was coming into the business, they couldn't see, or well, they really weren't sure how uh, this family thing could work with cousins working with cousins. Um, and so they amicably uh, decided to split the business where my uncle took the storage and my dad took the hire, and um, 
both businesses have done tremendously well uh, since that time. Yeah. And the irony is that I think our cousins, we sort of talk a bit and think, well, maybe we could have made it work. So, uh, But, you know, at the time that was the decision they made for the right reasons and um, both businesses have done extremely well. Well, yeah, which is awesome, you know. Well done, too. Well done. How, you know, from that one or that first branch in Artarman back in the in the late fifties or early sixties, how many branches have you got now? So we've got about one hundred and sixty-five uh, branches around across Australia and New Zealand, and um, and we've got about fourteen hundred people. Um, and we range from having general hire stores to a number of our specialty stores. Um, so we worked out that um, the knowledge band of our people and the focus needed to target specific customer, uh, we needed to have more of a focus and so we specialised certain equipment around products or market um, to be able to meet the needs of those customers better. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what would you say has been one of the keys? I mean, that's a fantastic growth. In fact, I read some um, somewhere in my notes that you guys um, doubled your business every five years for a 20-year period. Uh, what... You know, what do you think was the secret to that or the, the formula or, you know, if there was anything that you could pinpoint that you could share with the listeners that to attribute to that growth? So I think we had, um, at the time, we had a CEO who um, could see the opportunity of consolidation in the industry. There was a lot of fragmentation. And so he could see the opportunity and he um, was very good at, you know, acquiring businesses and opening branches, which we did um, for many, many years. Um and so that's sort of, I guess, been sort of a plank of our growth. It's actually just really continued. And, you know, for us as a family, it hasn't been about growth. You know, we we as a family never set a target for growth. It was a business to set that target. What our goal was to be um, was to maximise sustainable growth. So if we were going to grow, we were happy to do that in a sustainable way. Um, we didn't want to have growth that then was at the detriment of not being able to serve customers or deliver in a way that, you know, didn't meet our aspirations around uh, quality. Mm. And so do you think it's always been the fact that you've kept the customer uh, at the front of mind rather than a company goal of growth that's that's attributed to the growth? That's an interesting, um, you know, dissection of that because a lot of people will be going, well, I set goals to grow my company, but really you just set goals to really look after your customers is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, I think growth is more of an outcome. Um, you know, you can have the aspiration of growth and I think you need to have growth um, you know, to keep people energised. I think you need to have growth, you know, to keep, you know, aspiration of people. If you don't have growth, you know, you stop and, and um, you know, I think that's when you stagnate and, you know, when stagnate water smells and I think that's when often companies can develop that, you know, that, that bad smell if you, don't, if you don't keep moving, whereas running water, um, you know, like growth, I think actually allows and creates opportunities. Um, but it's not that's not our main ambition. We've never said we want to be the biggest. We really want to be the best. Uh, um, and that's really what we've set out to achieve. Yeah, and I think it's your mission, isn't it? Your mission is to be the best high company in the world. Is that right? That is our mission. That's our brand promise is to make our customer's job easier. And it really stems back to why we're here. My grandfather, you know, his, um, the reason why we started was he was actually trying to make a customer's job easier. Um, by servicing them, and I think that's really sort of remains true today. Is that we uh, try and do our best to um, achieve that goal. Great stuff. Now, so I'm always interested to hear because a lot of people, um, you know, think the mission and the vision and the company values and all those sort of things, brand promise, you know, whatever words you use, is the fluffy stuff. Um, but how important do you think that's been, though, or can you attribute that to the success that Ken Arts has had? I think with. Um I mean, you see a lot of mission and vision statements that sit on walls and it's actually the things that you bring it to life that's actually where the power sits with that. And for us, you know, our brand promise is to help make our customer's job easier, but it's our values that are actually a key part of our strategic plan. And we sort of have four values that we want uh, people to live by. Um, and I think it's the values, once you have common values, that's actually how you develop trust. And it's not about having everyone think the same um, because, you know, we want we want people to challenge us and present new ideas, but it's the values of the things that actually allows us to, um, you know, work better as a team, you know, not have the politics, have the trust, um, and, um, and they're the things that actually we ask our people to guide them in their everyday decisions. 
So our, our four values, um, um, you know, around, you know, my grandfather's philosophy, it's every customer raving fan. So, you know, we do whatever it takes to satisfy our customers' needs. And often our people have to break a few rules or processes sometimes to do that, but that's what they've got to do to, um, to make the customers' needs. Uh, fair income, which is about being true and honest and real. Um, uh, taking higher higher, which is around um, continuous improvement and innovation. And then the last value is around one family. So that's being a family business. Uh, we want us all to work together. We all want us to help each other. We want to make sure that, you know, from a safety aspect that we look after each other's backs. Um, and they're sort of, I guess, the main um, behaviours that we want our people to emulate is um, and live by those four values. Yeah, great stuff. Now, out of your, I mean, you said you have 1,400 in your team. Would, would you be able to walk up to any of those team members and say, tell me what our values are, our mission and our brand promise are, and they'd be able to recite that to you? Is it that well known throughout the organisation? I would hope it would be. Um, I mean, we have, you know, it's easy to stick it on a wall and people can sort of do that. But I guess where the acid test is is where they talk every day and you know, um, if someone says, I'll oh, call someone for, you know, that's not fair income, that's not real, um, you know, I guess that's where you sort of see these things come come to fruition and where people are working as individuals rather than groups, you know, they get called on the whole one family value. So that's, I would, um, I mean, 165 stores, if I went around and said, would everyone know it? I would say probably not everyone, but I would hope most people would be, you know, using that language, and I think in in everyday work, you know, they're the things that that, that we want to live by, and um, they're the things that, you know, I see branch managers sort of talking with their people every day about. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. And I think, I mean, looking at your values, I think there's there's some core messages in there. I, I'm really interested to hear from you, though. You know, you said every you want to make every customer a raving fan. I think that's a great value. Um, but you said there that you're happy for people if they have to break the rules to make that happen, um, which is interesting. Does that ever get taken advantage of, or you feel you know you feel that people use that in the right way, or can it be because it could be misused, couldn't it? Ah, oh, look, it could be, um, but I guess that's a cultural thing as well to say, you know, well, are they being fed income by doing that? And there will always be people that behave like that. Um, hopefully, our culture is strong enough that it actually pushes people out um, that are that are not going to live those values and we've we've had many um of experience where you know we've had to make those calls and people have made those calls and call people on it because i guess that's the fundamental thing as to why we're here yeah yeah great stuff great stuff and i think um you know the the whole uh fair income thing is great because it is about behavior isn't it you're calling people's behavior you're not making personal attacks you're just you're just saying that behavior wasn't right or you know how do we how do we remedy that Yes, and look, you know, behaviours, um, I don't think we all live by all those values all the time. You know, that's the, that's always the test. You pretty, know, we always, pretty tough ask, isn't it? <laughs> the, the challenge, you know, and where, where the angst or the personal angst happens is when, you know, you are, you know, potentially compromising your values. And I think, uh, you know, I guess we, we sort of always try and come back to that. And, you know, if we get tested on it, and I'm happy for people to test me on that as well. That that's really the um, the primary thing is that you know we're not always going to always live the values. We just got to make sure that people are trying to do their best and they call it out when they're not, and they actually you know fess up and say, "Yep, yeah, well I wasn't, but you know I will." Um, we're all human, and. Um, and I guess that's all, all we can ask. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I guess a lot of businesses um, look like they're overnight successes, but, you know, like yourself, started in 1948, about to celebrate in 2018, that'll be, you're going to celebrate 70th birthday. So it hasn't been an overnight success, has it? I'm sure along that journey there's been some um, hurdles or hiccups or, or moments of um, despair for the Kennards families that have been growing this uh, national organisation. What are some of the, you know, have, have they hit roadblocks through that time? And if so, what were they and, and how did they overcome them? Oh, I think every business um, hits roadblocks and, and I think you almost need to hit roadblocks in order to sort of get through it and become a, a better company. I mean, uh, you know, the early 90s recession, that was a very difficult time for us. Um, you know, I know that, um, you know, we had someone put in place and they'd, 
you know, escalated our cost base. And I remember my dad had to make some, you know, pretty difficult decisions at the time. Um, and I think, you know, every day, I guess you've got to make some form of difficult decision somewhere. Um, you know, I guess the the things for me that I find challenging is certainly around, you know, when you've got people that aren't living your values. People might be a high performer, but if they're not living their values, then, you know, there's really – there's really no future for them in our company. Yeah. Okay. So it always comes back to the to the values of the company, making sure that your team are are living and breathing those values. Yep. Yeah. Great stuff. So so let's talk a bit about um, the recession and and finances because I believe you know growing a company takes a fair bit of capital and um, you know we can either self fund or we can go and borrow. How did Ken Arts go about the growth? Did they did they just organically grow over time or did they go out and seek investment or? So we're. Um... We're 100% family owned. Um, we do actually have our our staff that own, you know, roughly about eight percent of the company. Um, so a lot of our long term people um, are shareholders, but in essence, you know, the control is of the family. How we've done that is, you know, I guess through, you know, funding it through our own growth and through our own cash. Um, we do have a, you know, facility with the bank. Um, but for us to be sustainable, um, you need to grow within your means, and sometimes, you know, that means you might not be taking advantage of every opportunity. Um, but you never hear of a company going broke because they don't own money. Um, so for us, you know, we have certain um, abilities to borrow to certain levels um, as a board, um, and then you know, our, after that, we need to get you know, family sign off. So it's just managing that risk. We want to be around for the next 70 years. And so, um, you know, we need to, I guess, be mindful of that and manage it in a way that's sustainable. Yeah, I guess that all ties back into the vision of the company to be the best, not the biggest. And I love what you just said there, was you've got to grow within your means. That's a huge takeaway there right now for the uh, the listeners that are out there growing their business. Because I see, especially the younger generation, and, and I don't know if you've seen this, Angus, but the younger people, they want everything to happen fast. Um, and we live in this world now where there is that instant gratification and, and you get this instant response. You put a picture on social media, you get someone liking it within seconds. Uh, but business is not like that, is it? It does take time to cultivate and grow a great business. Yeah, and I, and I think there's plenty of businesses that have grown dramatically quickly but also fallen dramatically quickly as well. And, um, you know, I think the uh, you know they talk about unicorns in the US where, you know, overnight these businesses are worth billions and billions of dollars. Yeah, but you can climb that quickly, but you can also fall that quickly as well. And so it's that balance between um, – because also there's there's also traditional companies that have grown over a long period of time that have also lost their way, you know, like the Kodaks of the world or the Blockbusters where, you know, they've rested on their laurels as well. So I think it's, it's trying to find that right balance between, yes, you've got to grow and you've got to grow in a sustainable way, but you've also got to be mindful of where – where the future is and, um, you know, with the amount of change that's happening in the world these days, um, it's really important to, you know, try and stay ahead of it and see see where the movement is. Yeah, great stuff. Now, talking about change in the world, one of the things that, um, you know, you have spoken about briefly was um, taking higher, higher. And so you're looking for innovation all the time. I mean, and this is true for many businesses. I mean, you just mentioned Blockbuster, Kodak. You know, here's some organisations that probably didn't innovate as quickly as they should have. Um, you know, how important has innovation been to the success of Ken Arts? Oh, I think innovation um, has been really important and I think it's becoming even more important. Um, and it's always a challenge in a big business is how do you innovate in a way that allows you to move quickly and learn quickly, you know, make mistakes. <laughs> and um, you know, how we've done it, we've sort of got a, an innovation team that's a little bit separate to the business. Um, so, you know, they're not sort of tied by, you know, the systems or or the cumbersomeness of Kennards. Um, so we're sort of trying to innovate um, a little bit differently outside of that. Innovation for us has always been, it's been quite easy around um, product. We've been a leaders in product innovation and introducing new product with our business We've been an innovator, you know, with regards to setting up specialist businesses. Um, the challenge is also how do you innovate your business model? That's always the most difficult thing um, because there's often a bit of a synchronisation about how your model works. And if you change one thing, it's going to lead to, you know, 
a cause and effect type thing with something else. And so for us, that's sort of a challenge that we need to think about is how do we ensure that our business model um, remains relevant? Um, you know, it's a high cost business model with lots of stores, you know, lots of real estate, lots of assets. Um, and we need to be, you know, making sure that we're ahead of that game. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so you've got an innovation team. That's, uh, you know, that's interesting. So you've actually got a team of people that are outside of, as you put it, the cumbersome systems or rules that may exist inside the business for its day-to-day operations. Uh, that allows them to think freely, I guess, outside the square. Yeah, and they're not sort of constrained so much by, you know, if times are tough, we'll, we'll cut things out. You know, innovation is probably one of the first things that people would cut. We're saying, well, actually, this is actually outside of that. And um, it's actually funded by the family as opposed to the business. Um, you know, it's something we see that, that that's important. And even, I mean, one of the innovations we've put in place is um, an end-to-end transactional website, um, which is the first of its kind in our space, um, you know, where you've got a rental company that you can, you know, if you someone turns up and they want a Camry, you don't have a Camry, you can give them a Commodore sort of thing. In our business, if someone turns up for a chainsaw, you can't give them a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so th- this website can actually tap into each branch and understands what is available um, and people can actually book it on, on online. They can pay for it online. It can turn up um, whether they turn up to the store or whether they have it delivered um, and that has been, you know, a huge element of growth for us. You know, it's, uh, it's almost like a virtual branch if you like and it's not going to be long before it's actually our largest branch. Yeah, and I guess the thing for you guys is that, uh, and, and any business with multiple outlets, is rather than having 165 separate outlets, you want to have one outlet in 165 places um, and that's really what technology is allowing you to do there by the sounds of things. Yep, you're spot on. Yeah, and what um, you know, talking about systems, a lot of business owners struggle with the whole systems thing. You know, would you agree that uh, systems have been important to your business growth? Have they been an integral part of it? Oh yeah, I think um, you know, systems and certainly technology is a key plank of investment going forward for us. Um, it's such an enabler of so many things. You know, process is one of those things, but also the customer experience, and where you've got. Um, problems, the opportunity actually lies often with technology and how you solve that problem. Um, you know, we, we have a, um, a porthole, like a plant portal where, um, you know, the, the, the issue around compliance and service history and risk assessments and how to and all, all that element when you go on a building site can be quite cumbersome. And we have a, developed a back-end program that uses the QR code on our equipment that can actually um, look up that item and actually look at the full service history of that item, get all the information about the um, supplier of that equipment, all the risk assessments, all the um, compliance that is needed on a site can actually access now through technology as opposed to, you know, having to print it out or having to fax it or email, you know. The whole onus is now put on the the actual user and um, it's actually enabled them to have, you know, and access to all that information. Yeah, which is great, isn't it? Amazing what technology can do these days. I'm sure it's saving a lot of time and uh, and money. What um what I'm interested to know, a lot of uh, smaller businesses get told about how they should uh, spend a certain amount of their time, research, development, planning, etc. Um, you know, how much of that is true for you? Are you more involved now in in creating and driving a business plan or are you still fairly hands-on? Because, you know, as the CEO of an organisation of 165 stores and 1,400 in your team, I can imagine your time would be fairly stretched. Yeah, well, I'm sort of less less hands-on in the branches as such, but um, I've spent a lot of time in that, so I do understand, um, you know, the ins and outs of a store and, and equipment and, and that side of things. But, you know, where i got to spend my time is, um, you know, with the people. So I still, you know, visit a lot of stores. I still get around to the stores and, um, you know, want to be visible to them. And I think there's a lot to learn from our people as to, the, you know, the conversations that um, they have with their customers and to sort of get a sense of where it's all heading. Um, you know, I've got to spend a lot of time, you know, with, with our people here um, in support functions to make sure that that's operating well, thinking about where the future looks. Um, so, you know, 
a lot of travel and sort of seeing different types of businesses and business models. Um, so that's sort of where I spend my time is, you know, probably at least a third of it out in the field um, and the rest of it sort of made up of, you know, thinking about where the future looks and, you know, I guess running the people that we have in our support functions. Yeah, great stuff. Now, when it comes to planning, are you, as a board, do you sit down and spend a week sort of locked away to build a plan every year or is it a quarterly thing? Is it a monthly thing? How do you guys go about uh, building your your business plan and, and then actioning it? So we um, we sit down and build a, a five-year strategic plan and then every year we have a, you know, spend time looking at what our um, initiatives are going to be for the next year in order to reach that goal. Um, so we do that as a board every year. We also do it as a leadership team every year. And then we sort of every quarter we meet as a leadership team to ensure that, um, you know, there's always strategic issues that come up um, that we want to try and, you know, review and solve. And then there's, you know, in between that, there's a lot of meetings and discussions around, um, you know, I guess the the smaller strategic um, elements that we need to consider as well. Yeah. And so, you know, being not so focused on growth, in your plan, is it more about how do we improve our, uh, our services or is it how we how do we make our team happier? How do we what, – what are the type of goals that you are setting in those, in those meetings? Um, I think when – I mean, we sort of see if you look after your people, generally they'll – what I've observed is they'll look after your customers. And so, you know, there's a lot of, lot of people initiatives we have around, you know, the development of our people um, – you know, to make sure they've got the right work-life balance. Um, we survey our people all the time to um, to understand, you know, what are some of the sentiments that are going on um, to make sure that, you know, what are their needs, their needs are being met. You know, one of the, th- the great things about a family business and the longevity is that we have all these fantastic long-term people who are committed. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, we've got some people have been with us for more than 45 years. And we've got, you know, a big chunk of our people that have been with us uh, for more than 10 years. And so uh, so it's really important that, you know, people are sort of the core of our success. And so investing um, in training and development, recruiting the right people, um, they're going to, you know, fit and work within the company are, are really important initiatives. Um, understanding our customers is really critical as well. So, um, you know, what can we do to understand what their needs are more, you know, it's being... Um, tailor equipment that's more specific to their needs, understanding their jobs. Um, that's a, a critical element. And then technology in, in how do you um, enable technology, not only for our people but also for our customers to um, be able to engage with us in a more effective way um, and also ensure that the experience they have, um, you know, is going to be the best it can be. Yeah, now looking at, uh, over the last 69 years of Ken Art's history, and I know you haven't been around for the whole thing, but I'm sure you're fairly up to speed with with where the company's been and, and what hurdles it's had. Is there anything, you know, that you could share with the listeners that you feel is worthwhile uh, knowing about that Ken Art's could have done better or shouldn't have done or did do that was great in that in that in in the history of, of the growth of the company? Um, I think I, th- I think with – I think people have their time in a company and, and – Businesses have a, a stage where there's different sort of leadership required for different stages. And my grandfather was very much an entrepreneur, um, but he wasn't very good at running a business. And one of the things he was able to recognise that. And so my dad and my uncle were really good at running businesses. Um, but it got to a point, you know, um, that probably the business was a bit beyond that as well. And so I think it's a matter of thinking about the right type of people that you need in the stage of the business that you're at um, because sometimes people can be great for a stage in a business but then it gets to a point where actually they could be counterproductive and, you know, normally people would have some form of role um, but it's about where they fit in the business which is, you know, which is critical. Yeah, yeah, which is a great, which is a great point. So you know, your grandfather was an entrepreneur but not great running a business and I think a lot of business owners are like that, aren't they? You know, they're – They've got the ability to to come up with the ideas, but maybe not execute. Yeah, and, and old school um, ideas aren't necessarily going to be the ideas of the future, and so um, I think just being mindful of that. Um, you know, my dad um, is very visionary as far as 
you know, where he see the businesses going. Um, but, you know, traditional ways of management aren't necessarily the, the you know, the ways that are going to work forward, especially with the current, you know, generations that you talk about. You know, they need to be managed and supported in a different way um, as opposed to, you know, um, you know, traditional managerial functions and lines and reporting. Yeah. I'm interested to know, I mean, a company that has evolved through many decades and it would have seen uh, many changes in technology. Are there? Do you wish that you jumped on the technology bandwagon bandwagon earlier, or have you got it at the right time? Or what? You know, what would you advise Peter business owners that maybe are a bit hesitant to start utilising technology in online shops as a way to grow their business? Well, I think it's the argument between being leading edge and bleeding edge. We've sort of said that we're not um, cutting edge technology, but what we do want to do is try and apply proven technology to our business so um you know there's i guess you could say the concept of internet of things is coming well how do we apply that well that's happening it's a technology that's you know i guess available now um how do we think of that that's going to be able to apply in our business in an effective way but being you know we're not going to be um you know we're not going to be, um, you know, uh, the cutting edge of artificial intelligence or anything evolve a bit further before we can see something that, you know, could apply for us. So, you, so you're looking for things that, you know, have proven to work and, and provide great value and then you're sort of plugging those in. Yeah. 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 Yeah, great stuff. I mean, it's really um, it's interesting, isn't it? And I know that, know that uh, technology has certainly changed the way business has have dealt with customers. I mean, you look at Uber as a classic example, Angus. You know, Uber has really um, changed the way that we move around, you know, like, and it hit the tax industry really badly. And I believe uh, from things I've read that the tax industry was actually exposed to that technology and and, and sort of knocked it back, which is sort of like the old uh, Kodak story, isn't it? So I think as businesses, we've got to be careful um, not to keep our eyes open, haven't we? Yeah, and, and it, why it changed is because they weren't meeting the needs of a customer. And that's really, you know, the mm. disruption happens is when, there's either a lot of slack in the system or you're just not meeting the needs of that customer. And, you know, when you used to get into a taxi and you had that, you know, protective guard and you couldn't fit your your um, your bags in the back because they had a spare tyre and then, you know, the, it was dirty and, it, you know, it was, you know, and you're paying 10% to pay by credit card and all those. So what they didn't understand was what their customers were and they were actually, for me, they were taking the piss out of them and, um, and it just left the door wide open for someone to actually understand what a customer wanted and about to re-engage. And, um, you know, now Uber, the largest um, taxi company in the world, and they don't own a taxi or even one car. Um, it's, you know, but they're, the people that use it are very satisfied with it. Pretty amazing, isn't it, when you think about it? Um, <laughs> You know, maybe maybe Ken Arts can follow too. You know, be the biggest high company in the world, not high, not own a piece of equipment. <laughs> maybe that's the future. Well, that's you know that's potentially where disruption could come from. Um, you know, I think there is certainly a trend towards renting things. I mean, you rent your music, you rent. There's <laughs> people don't really want to own stuff, so I guess you could say, well, there's an opportunity there. Um, but you know, there's also um, you know risk of of how that can play out. So. Uh, you know, we just need to be mindful of how we're going to play in that space um, and ensure that what we're doing is going to um, ensure that we're closer to the customer and minimise the risk of that disruption. Yeah, yeah, that's great stuff. Um, and what's the future look like? What, what's, you know, can you share with us a bit about the next five years for Kenards? Where do you see it going? Um, I think, um, I think well, technology is going to be a big part of that, so how do we apply that? Um, you know, we've got a few things in play um, at the moment, um, you know, disruption could happen. We need to be sort of mindful of that. Um, I think we need to even consider how work practices are changing. So in China, they're printing a house at the moment. You know, you can they print a house, so that's a work practice that could change to say, well, okay, well, why would they need any of the equipment that we currently hire if they can just go and print a house and it's done? Um, pretty amazing, isn't it, when you think about it? They're printing a house. My gosh. So, you know, maybe that's where, you know, we need to think about um, if that's where it's going, well, um, maybe that's where we can sort of provide access to that sort of technology um, to people, um, you know, and be a part of it. H hire out house printers instead. 
Possibly, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it, when you think about where it's going. It's scary and exciting at the same time, though, isn't it? So, uh, you know, I think we've just got to watch this space. Yeah, and even, I mean, I think it's not just looking within our industry, it's also looking within other industries of where things could move. You know, we've picked up lots of ideas over time about how we could apply, you know, certain technologies or certain processes, and um, that's worked pretty well for us. Yeah, great stuff, great stuff. All right, well, mindful, we're, we're running out of time. I really do appreciate you sharing what you've shared, mate. It's been some absolute gold and, and a bit of an insight into, you know, 69 years of a family business growing throughout Australia and New Zealand. I think that's just – that in itself is is great to get that opportunity to have this chat. How can people find out more, uh, Angus? Where do they go? Um, so, I mean, if you get on Facebook, you know, Ken Arts Hire have a page and they sort of constantly, you know, putting feeds on there on sort of current relevant topics. Um you know, you can get on our website. There's lots of stories around at uh, if you go to kenards.com.au and um, you can go and sort of see a little bit about Kenards. Um, there's a lot about the stories there. Um, there's lots of videos. You know, you can research equipment on site and you can actually book if you need to. So um, go and have a look at that. Um, it's a really good website. Um, also, you know, there's a no- number of other social channels that if you want to get onto, um, you know, Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, you can certainly get in touch with us that way as well. Great stuff. And I'm sure you're always looking for good people to join the Ken Arts team. So uh, is there an opportunity for someone if they've been listening to this interview and go, you know what, I think I'd like to be a part of that? Certainly. We're always looking for good people. Um, so certainly get in touch with us. We'd uh, love, um, love, you know, if there's new team members that want to join us, happy to have that chat. Great stuff, mate. Well, once again, I really appreciate you coming on the Business Brain Food Podcast. It's been an insightful chat and I think very inspirational as well. Uh, good luck with your new role there as CEO. I'm sure you'll do some great things. Sounds like you've got your, your head in the game and you're, you're heading in a real positive direction. Thanks, Ben. My absolute pleasure. Now, all we've got left to do, mate, is the 60-second scramble. Are you ready for that? Yes, certainly. All right, let's start the clock. Uh, what's your favourite drink? Uh, CC and Dry. Uh, Canadian Club and Dry, is it? There you go. <laughs> uh, what's your favourite book? Um, I, I like sort of motivational books, but, um, yeah, so any of those sorts of uh, business-type motivational books. Great stuff. Have you got an inspirational quote that you could share with the listeners that you love? Sorry, say that again? Have you got an inspirational quote that you could share with the listeners that you love? Um. I like uh, – I often like, um, you know, watching Churchill's quotes. Um, I'm just trying to think of one at the top of my head. Um, but he's – I love how he, um, you know, reverses the psychology of that, but I haven't got a, a quote off the top of my head. That's okay, mate. Have you got a hidden talent? Um, I uh, like racing cars to my mother's um, detriment. If you, She's not but, happy um, with that? <laughs> No, I've got four kids. She thinks it's very irresponsible. And she's probably right. Uh, <laughs> but if it's something you love doing, mate, then you've got to keep doing it, haven't you? That's what life's all about. You've got to pursue your dreams. Absolutely. Well, once again, mate, thanks so much for joining us for the Business Brain Food Podcast. Uh, like I said before, good luck with everything with Ken Ards. I'm really going to uh, watch you guys because I'm sure uh, you're going to be the movers and the shakers, not just in that industry but in business. They're really exciting stuff. Thanks, Ben. Business Brain Food. Well, there you go. That was a pretty uh, inspiring interview. You know, when you get to talk to somebody like Angus about, uh, you know, the business growth of a business that's been around for 69 years, you don't get that opportunity very often. So I really do appreciate that, Angus. Thanks so much for coming onto the show. Uh, you know, it was a, a pleasure to chat and learn from you, uh, an inspiration to myself. I, you know, I think that to watch a business that has been going for that long, uh, I guess, adapt and move with the times, with technology. You know, he's talking about not just technology changing, but the way that the business needed to be led, you know, and right now he's the CEO. But he said sometimes uh, the leaders of an organisation need to change because the leader's not right for the time. And I think that's a really good takeaway from that interview is that, you know, if you you may not be the right leader for your business right now. You may be entrepreneurial, you might be driven, you might be all of those things, but maybe you need to hire somebody else to run your company. Uh, you know, he spoke about not only we talk about technology and how it's changed the way we're doing business, but also the type of people that are now coming in as recruits and what their needs are and how that's changed. You know, so his team, the changes that have been required to be made for the team to feel happier and more involved in the business. And as he said, look after your team, looks after they look after your customers. What a um, a revelation there. You know, so I think at the end of the day. Um, I just love hearing from people like Angus because it's 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 about keeping it real. We look at these big businesses 
and we think that they are um, you know they're immune to a lot of things we are as smaller businesses sure they have um, you know more cash flow to do things with like to have an innovation team like that's pretty awesome to have a team of people to do innovation but there's no reason why you couldn't have an innovation team you just got to work out how um, because not only with their increased cash flow they're <laughs> coming in they also have an increased cash flow going out if you can imagine running 165 stores um, and 1400 uh, people's salaries you know that's a huge outgoing so I think as a business I've got to take my hat off them you know they've lived through some of the toughest times 69 years being in business and continue to be innovating and I think um, you know if there was any one key message in that entire uh, interview, it was continue to innovate and look after your customers. So they're my takeaways, and I think that's a great way to to end the podcast today. Once again, thanks so much for joining me. This was BBF 121. If you do want to get access to any of the show notes, uh, go to uh, maximumprofit.com.au. Look for uh, episode number 121. All the links that Angus mentioned and to Kenard's High will be in the show notes. You'll be able to click on those links and go directly to wherever it is you need to be. Uh, on a final note, if you are enjoying the podcast, two things that I've got for you to do is some homework. Um, the first part of your homework is head across to Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash groups slash business brain food and join the business brain food group. It's a closed group of business owners. It's moderated. We don't let anybody in there doing spammy stuff. It is a business chat. You can ask questions, join the conversation right now. You're missing out. Uh, that's uh, facebook.com slash groups slash business brain food. Uh, that's the first bit of your homework. Second bit of your homework is to head across to the iTunes store or the Stitcher app, whichever one it is that you use, and leave a review or rating. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, it does help us. Uh, I read them all, so it's great to get your feedback, but of course, people that come across the show, and it also helps with the rankings inside the iTunes store. So if you wouldn't mind helping me out, head across to the iTunes store, leave an honest review and rating, and uh, and that'll be you know that'll be uh, brilliant. That's all I could say. <laughs> I'm lost for words there. Uh, so that's your homework. Join the Facebook group and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed today's show. Just as much as I've enjoyed today's show, it's been awesome. I just love interviewing people like Angus because it's just great to hear how down to earth he was and, you know, such a success story, such an inspiring success story. All right, until next week, have yourself a very profitable day. I'm uh, Ben Futrell. You've been bloody brilliant, and we'll catch up next week. Cheers. You can fly high. The Business Brain Food Podcast was brought to you by MaxMyProfit.com.au. Head to MaxMyProfit.com.au and grab your free business planning template.